I love my tools. Mm, so pretty. Ow, that's sharp. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. I have a pile of tools laid out here because I want to answer one of the most common questions that I get. And that is, I'm new to hand tool woodworking or I'm new to woodworking. What is the basic kit of tools that I should start with? What are the, what's the starter set I should have and spend some money on? So I want to dive into this and kind of have the perspective of what I started with and what I would suggest most people jumping into. Now this is kind of a touchy subject because a lot of people have personal tastes and ideas. Someone might have a tool that they use a lot more than other people or I might have a tool that I don't have listed, um, but other people might use it all the time and want to put it in there. So if there's something that you think I left out or something you'd like to add to it, uh, put it down in the comments below. I'd love to add it to the discussion here. So let, before getting into this a little farther, let's actually jump into the tools. So here's the basic toolkit, and I really want to start getting into the very, very basics, what you need before anything else. And really, that is a way to sharpen. And there are thousands of ways of doing it, whether it's diamond or whetstone or oilstone or sandpapers. Um, really, the simplest, the cheapest way to get into it is just sandpaper, and you can get it in all the grits. Um, so you can get it you know, up into the thousands of grits when you get into your automotive sandpapers. And one of the easiest ways is just a piece of glass or even a uh, table saw um, top or a piece of granite. You can tape it down on there and then you can use your chisel or whatever and work at it. Uh, whether or not you want to use a honing guide is completely up to you. Um, I started without any honing guide and I just used it the basic way, um, hand working it and getting used to that. So sandpaper and glass, uh, really that's how I started. Um, you can get into some basic whetstones um, after that. I'm going to be leaving a link to a lot of these tools in the description below. So if you want to see some of those, you can look down there. Um, eventually, um, most people recently have been getting into diamonds. They are just simple. They're easy. They're a little bit upfront cost, but they'll last you for years, and you don't have to worry about that after that. So if you have the money up front and you want to jump into once and done, um, diamonds are really what I suggest. I'll leave a link to uh, what I use down below. But now that you have a method of sharpening, let's actually get into some of the tools. The first and basic tool is a good half inch chisel. Uh, this is the most used tool in my shop. Um, it is the one that I grab constantly. I'm actually going to be doing a video soon about making an entire project with just a chisel and a mallet. And really, um, you can do everything with this. Every other tool in the shop is just a way of holding or a jig of a chisel. So um, yeah, get yourself a decent chisel right off the bat. Um, now when I say decent chisel, I don't mean dump hundreds of dollars into it. This is actually one I bought from all the, the grocery store. Um, the Harbor Freight chisels are one that I started off with. Um, they are, you know, for the price, you just, you can't beat them. Are they going to last you long? No. Is the handle great? No. Um, but for the price, uh, these will get you going and they'll get you into woodworking. The next two tools after a chisel is a handsaw or a panel saw and a plane. Um, I suggest most people starting with the number four. Um, I find it to be the most versatile, though a lot of people like a number five. It's a little longer. It's easier to joint with. Um, my person is the, the number four. Um, now, one of the problems with your first hand plane is knowing what actually is sharp. Um, how does it feel? And when I started out, I actually restored a hand plane. I didn't restore this one. It was another union I had. And uh, you, you don't know exactly what sharp is. And every time I sharpened it better, I was like, oh, wow, this is what sharp feels like. And then, oh, wow, this is what sharp feels like. Um, so a lot of people do like to actually buy new or going over to another friend's house to, uh, um, to try one out and feel what sharp feels like. Uh, but you can start off with a used tool and uh, get going. My first tool set was this saw, uh, a number four, a union, which I don't have anymore, I gave it away to a friend, and a set of Harbor Freight chisels. And I literally paid $12 for my first set of tools. I got this saw free on a rebate at a local hardware store. Um, I got this for $5, and then I got my set of chisels for $7. So I spent $12 total on my set of kit. And with these three tools, I built my workbench. 
Uh, really, you don't need much more than a, a, a simple set of chisels, a decent hand plane, and a cross-cut saw. Most of the, the cheap saws you're going to find in the, the big box stores are going to be these. They have hardened teeth. You can't sharpen these, um, but they're going to be sharp off the bat. They're going to be a cross-cut saw, and you can do most of your work with this. Is it the best saw in the world? No, but it will get you going, and it'll get you off the ground. So if you're looking for a cheap toolkit, Harbor Freight chisel, a restored hand plane, and a cheap saw that you can get at a big box store. Now, I haven't no mentioned a mallet, and that's because this mallet was actually the first mallet I made, um, and I made it with these tools right here. I didn't actually use anything else other than you know, a hand plane, a chisel, and a saw, and you can make a mallet. And really, a mallet can be anything. It can be a block of wood, it can be a, you know, a hammer from the hardware store, it can be just about anything. But making a good joiner's mallet, I think, is one of the, the next tools you're going to want. And it's a, a great learning skill, um, learning how to make the, the through tenon, um, how to uh, work with the end grain, how to do some shaping. This is a fantastic tool, and you can make it out of a piece of uh, firewood, which this one was made out of. They have a couple videos on how to make mallets as well. Next up, we then start getting into the other hand planes. If you have a number four, um, I, my, my next suggestion would be to get a number five. Um, get one and put a cambered iron on it so you can make it into a scrub plane. I have a video on turning one into a scrub plane as well. Um, it's a very versatile plane. You can do some jointing with a number five. Um, you, when you turn it into a scrub plane, you can do a lot of your large stock removal. Um, but at this point, you're going to start seeing other hand planes in garage sales and auctions and things like that. And you'll be like, ooh, I can buy that one. Ooh, I can buy that. And hand planes will just naturally come. You will find these all over the place. So don't worry about that. Unless you're buying something brand new, um, hand planes will solve themselves as you see them all over the place. Next step after that is actually getting a full set of chisels. If you didn't already get a chisel with yours, um, just get the regular set. And I like uh, I like about you know a quarter inch up to one inch. I rarely use anything larger than a one inch. Um, occasionally I do for pairing, but uh, yeah, you're you're, you're going to be pretty good if you're with you know a quarter, a half, a three quarter, and a one inch. Um, Ninety nine point nine percent of your needs will be solved in that set. After that, we need to start getting into marking and measuring. Now, I haven't talked about marking and measuring because, honestly, you can go without it. Uh, most of my pinch was done without marking and measuring because I'm using the actual stock, and I'll put the stock down there and draw a line around it and make my work on that. Now, a marking knife would be a very fantastic thing to have. I think it would be the first marking and measuring tool I would get. Um, you can do all of your marking you need with a marking knife. Um, I like to have a double bevel with a flat side. Um, it allows you to use this as a reference so you can mark right along the side of things, and you can flip it around so you can bevel off of either side. Um, just a simple tool, and it is a very, very useful tool. A lot of people use other things. Um, when I first got started, I used an X-Acto knife, um, but you can use whatever you want to uh, make a marking knife. For measuring and marking, a good marking gauge is fantastic. This is an old uh, Stanley. Um, it just has a hardened pin here with a stop. You can also get thousands of other types, but just about any type of marking gauge will serve you fairly well. You can also make them uh, fairly easily. I made my first few, and uh, they're a nice, easy tool and uh, they will serve you very well. Uh, measuring, I don't do a whole lot, and rarely do I measure much of anything over 24 inches, so I like to use this old folding rule. It works very well for me. Uh, they're not as easy to find, uh, but it is a, any tape measure will do well as well. For a square, uh, for a long time, this was my only square. Um, it's a six inch uh, tri-square, and you can do most anything with this. You know, you have 45 measurements off of the angle here, uh, which I rarely do anything with 45. Most everything, I just want to see if it's square. And uh, you do want to actually make sure that it is perfectly square. And I have a whole other video on actually checking your square to see if it is square. But uh, once you get one that you trust, um, this is the one that I use for almost everything. It is the most used square in my shop. And really, if you need something longer, you can actually put it on the edge and put a straight edge up against it and use that straight edge extending your square out farther. So it is a very, very useful tool. And uh, yeah. Now, from this point on, we're actually getting into tools that become a little bit more specialized. You can cut dovetails with this, but it's not really high-quality dovetails. Uh, you can get into a lot of other things. 
um, with just this saw. But eventually you're going to start saying, mm, I would like a saw that works better at that. The next saw I would suggest getting is a sash saw. Um, it is a back saw that is uh, you know, slightly deep. You can do your tenons and things like this. A cross cut is a little bit more of a versatile cut on here. Um, it is a, a fairly simple saw. This is one from Veritas. Um, but you can get uh, cheaper ones. It usually has about a, a two inch deep head uh, so that you can you can cut fairly deep into it. Um, just an all around generally good in my, my current shop. This is probably the most used saw I have. Um, it is all around good for most of the, the joints and tenons and things of that nature. You can then get into all of your other saws. Uh, getting a large hand saw is a, a good thing to get uh, a rip. Um, you'll find that you'll get them kind of in pairs of rip and crosscut. Um, a very large, heavy rip saw um, like this one is very useful. I use it quite a bit. Um, but you will find, as with planes, saws kind of come naturally. You can find them all over the place. The other thing is once you get into saws, you're going to start getting into sharpening, which means a good set of files. Um, getting a, a triangular file for sharpening your saws and other files, then you start collecting. Um, I, like When I'm at antique stores and uh, garage sales, I find files all over the place. And I like to have different files for different shapes and different uses so that I can um, shape wood and actually use them for that. But as with planes and saws, you will find that you naturally collect files. They appear everywhere, especially if you're going to garage sales and estate sales and antique stores. Now, one thing that most people are going to say is you haven't talked about drilling or boring. Um, and really, that's a boring topic, and I don't like to mess with it. <laughs> um, sorry, I had to. But um, this is where I would start bringing in braces and bits. Now, by this point, you've probably already bought a brace, because when you're looking for planes and saws, these are all over the place. You can pick them up for three, four, five bucks. Um, you'll probably end up with several of them by this point. So that's why I really don't bring it up because you're probably going to find them all over the place and get them all wherever you need. Auger bits, on the other hand, um, are kind of hard to come by, um, at least decent ones. And learning what you need from a good auger bit, especially when you're buying used, um, you're looking for one with a, with a good tip still on the lead screw so that that's good and sharp. And one where the spurs, these wings that stick out on the side, are still tall enough that you can sharpen them um, but haven't been sharp to the outside so that they're not a smaller diameter than the rest of it. And really it's something you're going to have to experiment with. You're going to buy them and they're dirt cheap. You can find them all over the place and you're going to find some of them that are good and some of them are bad and you'll learn what you like about them and what you don't like about them and what ones you want to get in the future. But eventually you're going to end up with a full set of auger bits as well. So that is really something that kind of will naturally occur and you will find them and buy them. Um, but at this point in the, the series is where I would talk about them because you don't use them quite as much as you use the other basic tools, but they are a standard tool that you'll need in your shop. Now, the next thing I would suggest getting are clamps. And you're going to need all different types of clamps, but the ones I probably use more than anything are bar clamps. Um, the aluminum ones for Harbor Freight are the best bang for the buck in my money. Um, but if you, can, uh, if you can find them, these um, classical clamps are fantastic. Um, I really love these things and they're just a pleasure to use. Um, as well as I often use a lot of C clamps and uh, traditional screw clamps, um, but these are probably the ones I use the most. And they're kind of something you will collect over time um, and you find as you need them, you have a project coming up where you need clamps, that's the time to go out and buy them. Don't worry about buying a large set of clamps right off the bat. Um, buy them as you need them for projects. They will come along naturally. Also at this point, I would say a card scraper. Um, you can make these out of old saw plates, um, but you will find them occasionally and uh, you can get them online. I'll leave a link to a couple of them I use, but uh, a card scraper is a fantastic tool to have. Now let's start getting into some of the specialized tools. Um, now, originally I mentioned a marking gauge, but getting a tenon or a mortising gauge, this actually has two different marking heads as opposed to just the one. So you can mark both sides of your tenon or mortise at the same time. Extremely useful. Um, these wheel style uh, marking gauges, I use this one all the time. This is one from Veritas. Um, I really, really love it. Um, it is my most common used marking gauge now. Um, a little bit pricey, but uh, they, uh, they'll be something you use quite a bit. So a mortising gauge, 
would be very good. At this point, I would also bring in a block plane. Um, now, if you're a power tool user, this might be one of the first planes you want to get. But as a hand tool user, uh, it's not as useful as some people think. Um, it would be the, the tool that I use for doing chamfering or small end grain work. Um, that's when I would bring in a good low angle block plane. But it's not a really ne a major necessity in the shop, at least in my mind. A router plane is probably one of the most useful tools if you are a power tool user, um, and you will find that you'll be using it quite a bit. Um, anytime you're, you're you know, cleaning up tenons or doing dados and grooves, um, this will be the last thing to reach into the bottom of the groove. A good router plane is fantastic. You can make these. Um, the first couple I had were ones that I made, and they are very simple to use, um, whereas you can still buy them um, antique or even new now. A spoke shave at this point would be something I would definitely bring in. Um, the more you get into it, the more you will collect spoke shaves. Uh, this is one that I made a while ago. I have a video on making it, um, but you can, you'll find all different types for rounded bottoms and shaped sides and different cuts and the ones you really like and the ones you don't you like that much. And you'll eventually have a collection of spoke shaves. But yeah, that's something definitely to be thinking about. A coping saw or a fret saw uh, will do you very well for getting into some of your details. You can do most of your curves and most of the, the shaping work you want to do with one of these. And at this point, you probably purchased one of these because just like with braces, you find these all over the place for two, three, four bucks. The antique ones work great and they're, they're dirt cheap. You can find them everywhere. The last tool I'm going to put in the basic toolkit is a plow plane. Uh, this Stanley number 45 is a fantastic tool for all those little things you want to do. When you want to cut grooves, uh, when you want to cut dados, if you want to start getting into molding, um, a 45 will do you well. Um, if you look around, you can buy the basic frame with one cutter. Um, you can probably pick them up for around 40 to 50 bucks. Um, doing a little bit of searching will do that. You can get one with a full set in the kit for around 100 to 125. Um, but they're a very worthwhile tool that you'll find grabbing uh, quite a bit. And uh, I just like them. They're a lot of fun to play with and uh, a good tool for the shop. So that's my basic kit, what I would start with. Um, now this is really, this is kind of basic. At this point, uh, you, you can make anything you want. You can make these tools do anything you want. And you, you're only limited by your imagination in figuring out how to accomplish a task with what you have at hand. And from this point on, you're really just going to be buying per task. I don't like it. Uh, when people go out and buy tools because they want to buy tools because at that point those tools are going to be the ones that sit on your shelf and you never use them. But if you have a task coming up where you're like, ooh, I need that tool, um, that's when you want to go buy the next tool on your set. But in all honesty, 90 to 90% of my work is done with these tools. Even though I have a large collection of other tools, these are the ones that I'm using constantly. They're in my shop, they're in my hands, they are the ones that are always within reach and I can grab and quickly use them and keep going. So this is what you should focus on and really you know, start from one end and work to the other and once you get to this point, you'll have a fully functional shop and you'll know what you want to get next and what is your next tool on hand. So yeah, having fun. I love my tools. So there you go. Uh, this is what I would consider a good basic set of tools. And uh, honestly, you can get by without the second half and just work with the first half. Um, several of my first projects were just done with a hand plane, a saw, and a single chisel. Uh, you can be amazed what you can get done with just those three tools. And I know that there are going to be a lot of people who are saying, oh, you should have added this tool to, you, to the list. I use it all the time. Or, oh, that tool, I never used that tool. Um, you know, this is my personal list. And once you get into it, you're going to find that there are things that you use that no one else uses and things that other people use all the time that you're like, I have no purpose for that tool. Um, so it really is kind of something you're going to have to learn and jump into it. But once you start getting into these tools, you'll figure out what you need from the future. And uh, you, can, you can buy what you need when you need it as opposed to just buying the tools to have them. So I hope you like this. A lot of information and ideas. And this is a really fun one for me. If you did like the video, please hit like and go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button if you haven't already. Also, I want to say an incredible thank you to the patrons on Patreon. You guys are the reason why this channel is continuing. If you'd like to help out and keep this channel going, you can click the link right over here. If you like this video, feel free to check out one of my others. You might find something you like there. And until next time, have a wonderful day.